let's start with the most basic question here. Could Do Kwon face criminal charges in the U.S.? Sure, potentially. It all depends on the facts. I mean, the important thing to remember in a case like this is just because people lost boatloads of money doesn't necessarily mean there was criminal conduct going on. There's a lot of uh, a lot of investments fail, a lot of businesses fail, people lose a lot of money, and that and that's not always the result of criminal conduct. So, you know, if investigators looked into it and found actual fraud versus it's just it was a massive mistake or bad judgment or an error in the algorithm or whatever, right? If they find actual criminal fraud, then certainly uh, criminal charges are potentially possible, but that, we don't know that yet, right? So how difficult is the burden of proof here for prosecutors? Well, it's pretty difficult. The criminal charges have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, that's the highest to a unanimous jury. I mean, that's the highest burden we have in the law. Uh, you know, for civil sanctions, fines and civil lawsuits by investors who lost money or civil sanctions by the SEC, the standard's far lower. They just need to prove, you know, misconduct or fraud by a preponderance of the evidence. Criminal fraud, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, is a high bar. And it's particularly difficult in these white collar cases because you're trying to prove what was going on in somebody's head, right? The, the, the entire case will hinge on what was going on in Quan's mind um, because the facts are kind of undisputed, right? I mean, everybody knows that the, the tariff you know, failed spectacularly and everybody lost all the money and those facts aren't really in dispute. The question is why and what was going on in his mind during the whole process. And because we can't read people's minds, that can often be difficult to prove. You're relying on circumstantial evidence and bits and pieces you can put together to lead a jury to infer that there was actual fraudulent intent going on versus just, like, like I said, something less. And so how do you do that? Are you looking at text messages, emails? How do you prove that intent? I mean, you look at emails, text messages, things like that. You hope to find kind of a smoking gun. You know, frequently prosecutors aren't fortunate enough to find that great email that lays out the whole fraud scheme. But you're looking for little nuggets of information and communications. You can have uh, testimony from witnesses who you know had conversations with him or who otherwise were involved. I mean, a classic way to build a fraud case like this is to do what we call working up the ladder, right? If there were multiple people involved, you build cases against lower level participants and persuade them to cooperate and testify. And if they had conversations with the upper level people, and that can be you know very important evidence. And then you also look for, again, little signs, inconsistencies, things that were done that are inconsistent with, you know, the truth or with a good good faith, you know, efforts to market the investment, things like that, that we call like badges of fraud, you know, little things that, that suggest that what, what was really going on here was a deliberate attempt to deceive investors versus, uh, again, something less, just a mistake or, or bad investments, things like that. I mean, an example would be in the Theranos case, you know, with the uh, 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 Elizabeth Holmes. You know, one, one example of that is, you know, using the other company's machines, right, to to actually run the tests, but telling investors that their machines were working and performing these tests. You know, things like that are pretty suggestive of an intent to actually deceive and defraud, steal people's money, versus just again misjudgments or mistakes or or other lesser forms of of misconduct. Now, you spoke about this earlier, but outside of criminal charges, are there potential repercussions from the SEC, whether that's fines or penalties, or is this more the domain of the CFTC? A lot of other potential repercussions are probably actually more likely, right? Because, again, that criminal charge is so so difficult to bring. But there can be civil sanctions from regulatory agencies like the SEC, the CFTC, and civil liability from lawsuits, right? I mean, investors who were burned uh, can certainly pursue civil claims and try to get uh, damages get their money back. Uh, and again, that's probably, you know, much more likely than uh, potential criminal charges, uh, given that the standard of proof is lower. So, you know, frequently in these kinds of cases, the appropriate remedies end up being civil and regulatory and administrative and actually not criminal. I mean, how bad could the fines or penalties be from the SEC? Like, what's the worst case scenario here for Do Kwan? The fines can be based on the amount of the loss, right? So, I mean, they could potentially be pretty staggering when you're talking about what was a $60 billion loss or something like that in a, in a case like this. So um, uh, potentially uh, extremely heavy. Um, the, uh, you know, there's going to be issues with jurisdiction and things like that too, you know, since he's not in the U.S. Um, you know, South Korean authorities might have something to, to say about possible sanctions. And I, you know, uh, so there are a lot of other potential agencies or governments, you know, 
who could take a look at this conduct in addition to the private individuals who were who were harmed. Now, some have said that Anchor, which is a staking platform that promised participants an APY of 20 percent, was unsustainable. Others said it was a Ponzi scheme. Could this platform in particular be singled out? And calling something a Ponzi scheme is is just kind of the conclusion, right? If you're calling it a Ponzi scheme, you're saying by definition it was a fraud. So let me just get back to all the prior questions we were talking about earlier. Um, Can uh, prosecutors actually establish fraud and fraudulent intent versus, versus, uh, again, some other kind of lesser misconduct, mistake, bad judgment, what have you? Uh, But any entity where you know, prosecutors can establish actual criminal fraud, which is basically a deliberate attempt to steal your investors' money, right? You're not, you're not simply peddling an investment that turns out to be a bad investment, but you have that criminal intent to deceive them, to take their money, to harm them. You know, any entity or individual where prosecutors can prove that then is potentially on the line for a fraud case or fraud prosecution. I also wanted to ask you about some of the ancillary players here from the, you know, the the crypto exchanges that were offering these products and and saying that they were safe investments to some of the investors who also, you know, were promulgating the narrative that this was a good buy, a good investment. Do they get caught in the crosshairs at all? Well, again, it's all very case specific. Assuming there was criminal conduct, if some other individuals are colluding with him, you know, to to promote the investment, knowing that it's bad or knowing that it's phony and trying to steal people's money, then sure. Um, If people are just promoting it because they were taken in and, uh, you know, believed in it uh, and were deceived like a lot of other investors, but they don't have that subjective intent themselves to actually try to harm anyone, um, then no. So it's all very fact specific and individual specific, right? It's hard to generalize. But again, anybody who's involved in that scheme with actual intent to defraud versus just being caught up in it or enthusiastic about it or really believing in it turning out to be spectacularly wrong, you know, uh, and anybody who's actually involved in it with that fraudulent intent then is potentially on the line as well, sure. In terms of timing, what are we looking at here in terms of what we might see from a regulatory body like the SEC versus criminal charges? Well, the regulatory actions can move a lot faster, uh, but none of these things happen quickly. Usually there's, you know, millions of pages of documents and records and things to go through. And in particular, when we talk about crypto, you've got, you know, incredibly complicated, sophisticated schemes uh, or platforms at issue that take some time to sort of decipher if you're trying to prove, you know, fraud or other kinds of misconduct. Uh, So nothing, nothing like this happens fast. And white collar cases are kind of famous for uh, taking months or even years because of all the documents you have to accumulate, all the records you have to go through, and then all the witnesses you have to try to talk to. And again, when you're trying to build this little, this case kind of piece by piece with circumstantial evidence, it's not like, you know, a, a homicide where so you bring in witnesses and testify to who pulled the trigger and you can kind of, you know, resolve it by eyewitnesses and people who saw what happened. Here again, we're trying to prove what was going on in someone's mind. That's often a very painstaking process that involves reviewing you know, lots and lots of documents and talking to many, many people and dealing with all their lawyers throughout process and scheduling grand jury time and court appearances. And it just, it can really drag on. So nobody should expect anything to happen uh, overnight.